morning. If you'll open your Bible this morning to First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 29. I'm going to look at two verses, <clears throat> verses 11 and verses 12. First Chronicles 29, 11 and 12. If you take notes, I've entitled the message, Absolute Power. Absolute Power. Thus saith the Lord. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Before we look at our text, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord uh, to walk amongst us and, and speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, we come to you in thanksgiving uh, for all the word of God. It's all inspired. But in this specific text, Lord, we're looking at the omnis omniscient or excuse me, omnipotent power that you have. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, you would walk amongst us. And if there's one here today listening who doesn't know Christ as Savior, we do pray that today would be the day they'd come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And for others, Lord, we pray that you would speak to all of our hearts. You would bring edification where it's, ne where it's needed, conviction where it's needed. Anything that we need, Lord, would you, would you give us a blessing in the, in the preaching of your word? Would you, it's going out, it will not come back void, but would you just give us a blessing that we can take home and use in our life or share with another? Oh God, thank you. We ask of a great faith and always in Christ's name, amen. Absolute power. You know, in the world we live in today, power is everything. Or trying to everything is everything is uh, run by power, and the governments are using all their power to stay in power. But ultimately, all all worldly power is really limited. It's limited in scope, and it's limited in time. The power that uh, this country once had, uh, and I'm not going to get political, but the power this one this country once had, it no longer has the will to use that power, at least for good. And so when we look at, when we look at power and we look at it from, from a worldly point of view, there is power, but the power is very limited. When we look at God, altogether different, we're looking at absolute power. And that term absolute means without regard to any other ordinance, by itself it stands sovereign. Nothing is over it. And that is a perfect definition of the power of Jesus Christ. Now, in our text here this morning, we're looking at a prayer that David offered when he was dedicating uh, the new temple that was going to be built and also uh, the coronation of Solomon to be the new king of Israel. And who better to offer this prayer about power than a man after God's own heart who knew all about God's power. Very few uh, biblical people <laughs> saw the power of God as much as David did. As a shepherd boy, we, we know God delivered him from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. He delivered, he delivered uh, Goliath to him. He kept Saul uh, uh, away from him for, uh, for, while he was hunting him for 12 years. He kept him safe. He fed him. He had 700 men plus their wives and children. And God fed them each and every day and protected them. And for 40 years, he watched God dispose of Israel's enemies and rule Israel. David understood the absolute power that God had. At the end of his life, this is what he testifies. He, uh, he testifies about his God the God of 1 Chronicles 29, 11, and 12. And I say his God as a matter of distinction because David's God, the God of this verse, is unknown today. 
It's unknown in the church today. Pulpits today, they don't teach or preach much on God's sovereignty or the doctrine of sovereignty or the power of God. Reason? Because you don't fill pews by teaching God's truth. Churches today are talking more about things that are going on in the country. They're talking about uh, good things that are happening to people. There's no sin. There's no repentance. There's no God. They don't have God's truth. And all that that does, <clears throat> all that that does is it makes the God that they're worshiping more human than divine. And when God is humanized, when anybody humanizes God to the degree that the, the, the evangelical church does today, it degrades and dishonors uh, his power, his, um, uh, his uh, absolute power. In a sense, today, in a sense, today's churches celebrate man and they make man little sovereigns. In other words, there's churches that say, you know, God loves everybody. Uh, they say that uh, you're good, I'm good, and don't worry about sin. You know, just tell God you're sorry and it'll be okay and just move on. All they're doing is they're patronizing people. They have a Bible, they have a church, they have an organist, they throw money in the pot, and they're talking about everything to make people happy. God wants you to be happy but he wants you to do it his way. And his way is to understand that you're not in charge of anything. God is in charge of everything, including the world, including your life. Every single facet. In, if there is one molecule in this, in this universe that God's not in charge of, then he's not God. And if God's power is absolute, it's in your bulletins, if God's power is absolute, then it's obsolete. It doesn't fit. Either God is sovereign and all-powerful over everything, and his name is Elo Elohim, Jehovah, Elohim, God Almighty. And today, that is really an unknown God in most of the evangelical church. He's unknown. And I dare say that the charge today against the apostate uh, people in the Old Testament is the same charge that's, that today the church is under. They're worshiping a God of their imagination, not a God of, of the Bible, of the scriptures. Give you an example of that. Many, many evangelical believe Satan's lie, that God is moved more by uh, uh, emotion than he is by, by principles, righteous principles. And they dishonor God when they do that. Yeah, imagine Satan is frustrating God. Can you believe that? Oh, God's having a tough time with this. You know, Satan's really putting up a good fight. No, he's not. He can't fight against absolute power. He's a created being. They believe the devil has almost the same power as God. Not true. He's, a, he's an angel. They forget the first five words in Genesis 1 is, in the beginning God created. And that includes Satan and every other creature in the world, in the universe. Anything that's, anything that's here was created by the absolute power of God. And that includes the archangel. Let me tell you what Revelation 4.11 says. Matter of fact, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. I want to read that. This gives you some idea or a better idea of the of the um, absolute power of God. Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for here it comes, you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. There's not one thing in this world that exists without God. Now, they may think that there's alien life, they may, and there may very well be, but if there is, he created them. He created everything or he can't be God. Do you understand that? You can't claim to be God Almighty and have anything over you. You can't have anything surprise you. You can't do that. 
because then you're not God. And just for the record, when God made creation, the universe and everything in it, he made it like this book in one shot. He put in everybody's name that's ever going to be born, every event that would ever happen in life, every insect, every atom, every molecule, everything. And then when he said, let there be light, it all started going. And we're just part of it now. There was Genesis 1 and 2. Everything was perfect. There was Genesis 3. Nine times started in Genesis 3. Why? Because man sinned against God. And from Genesis 3 on, time keeps going on. But it was all accounted for in, 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 create, in uh, eternity past. Everything. There's nothing new in your life. It's new to you, but it's not new to him. He knew, he knew, for example, everything that was going to happen. Everything. You know, I, I use this as an example a couple of times, and I hope I don't wear it out, but it's true. You ever watch a movie several times? You ever see it, and you look at it, and you just love the movie, you love the plot or the characters or something? And as you look at it after the third time or so, you say, oh, yeah, watch this, watch this. You know what's going to happen. In a sense, that's exactly what God did. He made everything. He knows what's going to happen. And he tells his children, I am the creator and I have, con I have made everything and they consist because of me and my, and my absolute power. You understand that? And it's very important to understand that the difference between his power and any other power is that it is absolute. Nothing is over it. Nothing can change it. Nothing. What a wonderful thought. If you're a member of that family, what a wonderful thought. That the one who holds absolute power has said to you, come, I want you to be my son or my daughter. Come, live for me, and I will give you life now and forevermore. And he can back it up. That's what makes it absolute. That's what makes it so wonderful. We also see that absolute uh, sovereignty of God and his absolute power over all creation. If God, uh, and if God has a plan for believers, if he does, most of the evangelical church believe it must be like their plan. Well, God's working this out. It's my plan, too. I wanted to do this. I did that. I tell you uh, uh, something that happened to me this morning. I have trouble with my glasses sometimes uh, reading my notes. And so this morning before I left for church, I said, well, you know, I'll go downstairs. I have a studio downstairs. I'll go downstairs and get my other glasses, thinking that's what I needed to do. I went downstairs, and I have a lot of uh, paintings and uh, uh, wooden, wooden, uh, can wood not canvases, but wooden panels. They need to have no moisture. Well, I go downstairs, and guess what? My dehumidifiers shut off. And the humidity in there is right, uh, right up at about 65 67%. I went there, wasn't the glasses. I got the humidifier all cleaned out, turned it back on, lowered the thing, saved all that artwork, okay? It wasn't about the glasses. I was being led there. If I hadn't have done that, I probably wouldn't get there till tomorrow, and by that time, it would have been too late. And you can look at that as luck, chance, or coincidence. You could look at that like he just went to get his glasses, or if you're a Christian believer, you'll look at it like God led me down there because he wanted me to fix the problem. And it isn't the first time that happened. And there are people here in this church that can tell you exactly the same thing, how they were how they were led to do something, and then when they got there, they did this thing, and oh, wow, and something good happened from it. It helped them. That's God leading. That's, that is absolute power at work in your life. He doesn't say, go over there, get over there, and do that. He doesn't grab you by the ear like your mom did. He doesn't do that. Instead, he influences our hearts. You see, he's a loving father. He calls us his children because he loves us. And he wants us to understand that. And he wants us to draw nearer to him. Don't we, as parents, isn't that what we want for our kids? Don't we want our kids to come up to us? Don't we want our kids to love us for, for us loving them? And it's very difficult sometimes with kids. <laughs> very difficult, especially when they get older. 
but you always love them. Why? Because they're yours and you belong to God and his absolute power is protecting you. If you go to the book of Hebrews, you go to uh, chapter one, verse 13, you will read about the, the uh, he says, are not spirits, speaking of angels, are not spirits, uh, ministering spirits to the heirs of, heirs of salvation. And what he's saying is every single chosen child of God had a guardian angel from the day they came into this world. You look in the Greek, in the original text, the word um, uh, that they use for that is in the future tense. In other words, it's going to happen. So that means that even before the worlds were formed, God had a battalion of angels looking out for all of his people from the day they were born. And I can't tell you, I was in the military during a very violent time. Uh, my brother Mike and I, he was in the Marine Corps. I was in the Navy. And we served, we put our names on the line and there were, I worked with, with munitions, with explosives. And a couple of times, you know, I thought, well, this is the end of it, it'll be quick. But I wasn't saved, it wasn't my time. Do you understand that? It wasn't my time, I was called to be a child of God. And then at age 49, that calling came. I didn't want God before that. I thought God was just a, uh, an imaginary thing that weak people use to get through life. They needed a crutch. So let's use God, go to church, throw some money in there, and we'll feel better about it. That's what I thought. But when he called me, and he called me one day, and everything changed. Everything changed. My whole life changed. Ask anybody that's been saved. They'll tell you, once you understand God and you feel that absolute power of him in your life, your life changes all for the better. Maybe not to your unsafe family or maybe not to your neighbors or work work uh, uh, people you work with, but you you know your life has changed much for the better. Their plan. Isaiah talking about uh, their 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 plan, God's plan is like their plan. but Isaiah 55 9 says, "For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher." than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. We can't understand God. I was talking to somebody this morning. He said, you know, I don't understand why God did this. I don't understand. I said to him, you know what? If you could understand God, really understand him, he wouldn't be God. God is beyond knowing. And what he gives us here is nothing compared to who he is. It's not even worth mentioning. Our ways are not his ways until we get saved. And then slowly, our ways become his ways. And the Arminians, people believe that uh, they, made a, they made a choice for Christ. I was an Arminian when I first got saved. They believe God's power has to be limited so man can have free will. They don't want to become, as I was told uh, when it was an Arminian, we are not biological love robots. That God makes us and and we're and we and we have nothing to say in it, and He makes us and we love Him automatically, and we're a robot like this. That was that was that was the way I was taught. Absolutely wrong, absolutely wrong. Why do we know it's wrong? We know it's wrong because first and foremost of all, nobody goes seeking God. Romans, I think it's Romans three eleven and twelve. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who seeks after God, no, not one. No, I wasn't going to go looking for God. If he didn't come looking for me, I wasn't going nowhere. And it, it reminds me, when Adam sinned against God, did Adam go looking for God to say he was sorry? No. God went looking for Adam, and he found him. And he found each and every one of you that know him this exactly the same way. So we don't choose God God chooses us. Since Adam and Eve, no human being, listen, no human being outside of Adam and Eve ever had free will. And I can prove that to you in the Bible. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 6, verse 16. Just turn it real quick. Here's the reason. Because you come into this world with something called original sin. It means that you're made slaves or you're, or you're in bondage to it. Romans 6.16 backs that up. Backs that up. 6.16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of, either of sin, which leads to death, 
or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And what he's saying is this. Before Christ, you were being led by sin. When you came to Christ, now you're being led by Christ. So when you were before Christ, you were being led by evil, by sin. You made choices and decisions, but they were all sinful. When you came to Christ, you still make decisions. But the nice thing about it now is you know what's good. You know what God says is good. You know what God says is bad. And you make a choice. It's not free will. You're still under the influence of God. And because you're under the influence of God, we don't, we don't, uh, pract uh, believers don't practice sin. They fall into sin. And by falling, I'm saying they, they sin occasionally. It's not a, it's not a, a thing that we repeat all the time that we live by. And that's how we know because we're influenced by God not to do that. And Jesus says all sinners. And another thing about that is he says all sinners, and this is hard stuff, but he says all sinners have Satan as their spiritual father. When you come into this world, you have a regular father and you have a spiritual father. Why? Because you're a spiritual creature and you're a, a temporal creature. And the verse that backs that up is John 8, 44. Here Jesus says to, the, the, to his disciples who are following him, who claim to follow him, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you, wanna, you, you want to do. And what he's basically saying is this. He's saying, I'm telling you the things of God and you're doing what you want to do, which isn't what I'm telling you. In another place, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? It's all for the same reason. They're under a different influence. They're under the influence of evil rather than the influence of Christ. The Arminian belief that they chose God steals the absolute power. It steals the power from God. It makes them like a little sovereign. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is so clear in, on that. It says, believing you choose God turns that gift of salvation into an offer. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, is, it's no offer. It says, you are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, least any man should boast. Now, I'm not a theologian, but I can tell you that's pretty clear. That's pretty clear to understand. It'd be kind of tough to move that around a little bit. You are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works. If I chose them, then I'm, I'm doing works. Not of works, least any man should boast. That's pretty clear. And when you don't believe that, you're dishonoring, uh, you're dishonoring God's sovereignty. And actually, when you think about it, uh, um, an offer that dead people, spiritually dead people, blind and God-hating sinners can choose or accept God. Does that make sense to you if you're not looking for him? And the Bible says in Romans, uh, in Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is hostile to God. Neither can it know the things of God. In 1 Corinthians uh, 1, uh, 114, uh, 114 says, the natural man discerneth not the things of God, for they are spiritually discerned, and neither can he know them. Does that sound like somebody that's going to go out looking for God? I don't think so. Not to mention Ephesians. I'm giving you a lot of Bible verses because A, this is a Bible church, and B, this is not an opinion. It is not an interpretation. I'm showing you how clear it is. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 backs everything I just said up. Paul writes, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That just summarized everything I just said, and that's from God's word. Does that sound like a choice to you? Not to me. Today, the God that most professing Christians worship is an idol carved from man's imagination, and it's true. Today, uh, whether whether uh, this counterfeit God is a is a he, I've heard him I've heard him called he, she, it, the. It's a human invention of human, a uh, foolish human um, uh, emotions, and sentiment. That's the God that most people worship today. If you've talked to anybody that goes to a uh, most evangelical churches today, I think if we just take a moment and think about how many churches are flying flags in front of them, immoral flags in front of the church, I guess that could tell us something. Someone has written 
And this is an important thing. Somebody has written, I found this, it said, the heathen outside of the pale of Christendom formed gods out of wood and stone, while the millions of heathens inside Christendom manufacture a god out of their own carnal mind. And I thought that was a perfect description of today's evangelical church. Listen to me. Any god whose will can be resisted, any god whose plans can be obstructed, any god whose purpose is checkmated is no god at all. And anyone, anyone who worships that type of god is in reality a closet atheist. A closet atheist. I say that because scripture makes it abundantly clear God has absolute power, period. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Turn there with me, please. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. Now read it with me as I read it. Thus saith the Lord, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning... And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. You understand that? That's God's word telling that he has absolute power over everything. So either, either, and this is it, you either believe the truth in the Bible, or you're a closet atheist whose God is one that you carved out in your mind. And I want to tell you something. It's You, you might think that's really a, a strong statement, but I've been in touch with many people who do believe many things about God, and they're all pagan. God does not love everybody. John 3.16, if you look it up in the original language, it doesn't mean that God is having an intimate relationship with the world, especially when we know, above all things, that there's a hell and those who don't come to Christ end up there. We know that. There are people who worship a God that says that uh, evil is good and good is evil. The things that this country was, uh, that this state even was, was, was uh, found criminal acts to do have now been legalized and are promoted publicly. You understand that? They're calling evil good and good evil which is okay because that's that's the plan God has for the moment. But the fact of the matter is there are people who worship a God that they say allows that. There's a people who say that Sodom and Gomorrah is a metaphor. It's not real. There are people who say that God winks at sin, that he's a benign old man who sits in heaven. Oh, come on now, Brian, you could do better than that. That's not what he says. He says you do it or I'll chastise you until you do. And I'm glad that he does that. Anybody that loves me needs to know that I am sometimes not always on the mark. And when I'm not on the mark, I expect him to put me on the mark. And you should do the same. What child would you would you not do that to that you love? If you had an errant child and that child says, uh, uh, does something, he doesn't clean his room, he swears. Let's use that. He swears. He's got a mouth like a, like a, I won't say a carpenter, I'll say a sailor, okay? He's got a mouth like a sailor. Because <laughs> we got a carpenter here and I don't want to say that. <laughs> All right. Say he does that. Say he does that. And you say to him, oh, Johnny, please stop swearing. Stop swearing. Yeah, mom, ba, 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 ba. No, Johnny. No, Johnny. That's not nice. Don't. Do Is Johnny going to get any help from you if you do that? No. Johnny, the next time you say that, I'm going to take your cell phone for a week. Now you got his attention. Let him swear. Take it for a week. Watch him whine. Watch him moan. Watch him turn. He hates you. He does all those bitter things. But you know what you're doing? You're chastising him. You're trying to teach him to do good and not evil. And I want God to do that to me. And you should want him to do that to you too. But it's far easier to do it on your own. But if you don't, he'll do it. Why? Look at that cross. That's what he paid for you. What that represents. All the blood, all the suffering. His only son, just for you.
Now, if you're listening to this and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're without Christ, or maybe you're a professing Christian that have that worships an idol that you've carved in your head of your imagination. I, I'd like you to look up the scriptures uh, that I that I've quoted, and you'll see you'll see that what I'm telling you comes from God. It's not from me. And I want to state one other thing. It's absolutely, absolutely a matter of life or death that you do that. And I'll tell you why. You got one shot at salvation. When you die, there's no do-overs. The only thing a person leaves, every human being that leaves this earth, the only thing they're allowed to bring with them is one or two, of, one of two things. If you're unsaved, you're going to bring your sin with you and you're going to stand before God and he's going to judge you, your punishment by the sin that you brought. You're not going to hell or the lake of fire simply because you have sinned. You go to the lake of fire because you looked at that cross and the sacrifice it represented. God presented his son and his blood, the blood of his son, so that you would not have to pay your sin debt because you can't pay your sin debt unless you do it for the rest of eternity. Only Jesus Christ can pay that debt. So if you leave this world without Christ, what ends up happening is you're taking your sin with you. You'll, you'll, you'll be in a holding tank. That's what hell is. On judgment day, you'll be, stand before God and you'll be judged. Uh, you'll be punished for the sins that you committed against him. You're not there because of those sins. You're there because you took his son's blood that he sacrificed for you. And you did this to it saying, I don't need it. I have a God in my mind. I'm going to worship him because it's easier to live that way. Well, then you'll die that way. Make no mistake about it. All of you right now, the heart's beating in your heart, right uh, in your chest right now, it's as real. What I'm telling you is as real as that. That's option one. If that's you, why, what are you doing? What are you doing not coming to Christ? Listen, the Bible makes it abundantly clear. If we repent of our sins, that means we turn away from them. If we, if we repent of our sins and we decide that we want to live a different life. And we'll only do that if God calls us. And if he calls you, you feel him calling you. You know he's calling you. Then just repent of your sins and say, Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry for what I did. Forgive me. Save me. Save me. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He's never turned anybody away from him, ever, who came to him, ever. When he was on this earth, he never went by a funeral when he didn't, when he didn't bring back to life the dead. When he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and all the, saw a sea of sick, wailing people who had demons, who, had, who were blind, who had leprosy, all the diseases of mankind, he healed them all. Because that's what he came here for, to show you that he's real. Now, I want to tell you something. I don't know, I don't think any of us here were here when Delaware crossed the Washington, but the history books tell us that he did it. In the same way, I'm telling you, I didn't have to be at the Mount of Transfiguration because this book tells me, it tells me that he did it. And that's enough. And by the way, everything this book tells me is true. And you know how I know it? Because I've been living it for 26 years and I've never found a mistake. And I actually looked for it for many years. Where's the contradiction? I, 66 books, no possible way. None, zero. Don't leave this planet carrying your sin. Leave it. Leave it with Christ. Come to him. Don't make his, don't make his sacrifice that he made for you. Don't make it worth nothing. Just come and ask him to save you, and he will. Now, I want to look at this text for just a few minutes. It's only one of the major verses that fill the Bible that shows God's absolute power. Listen to the words. Uh, turn there. Turn to our text. First Chronicles. What did I say? It was 29, 11, and 12. Turn there. I, I highlighted a few of the words. This is a prayer. He says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory 
and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Do you understand that? All the greatness, the power, and the glory, and the victory. You know you have victory over everything in this world? Did you know that? Did you under, do you understand that? In other words, there's nothing in this world that can overcome you. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I give you power to, to uh, step on serpents and scorpions. That's a, that's a, a metaphor for, doing, for anything that would harm you. And he goes on at the end and finishes. I give you all power over uh, serpents and scorpions and over power of all, the, all evil and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Do you understand that? Do you understand that you cannot be hurt? You can't even make a bad decision. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. If he calls you and you make a bad decision and it blows up in your face, even that will work out for your good because of his absolute power. There's no such thing as an accident in the spiritual world with God. There's no such thing as a, as a travesty or as something as horrible. Nothing. The physical aspect of it may, may be, but the benefit of it, the spiritual benefit of it is always good. He always turns adversity into goodness for his people. Do you understand that? It's so important that we understand that the absolute power of God can do that with everything because he's already ordained your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know my plans for you and they're for good and to give you a hope. Those are, that, that, that's the proof that he knows your life and everything in your life. You might look at him like, oh, why did that have to happen? Or why did this have to happen? Wrong attitude. It happened, it happened because God wants you to grow. And that's what adversity does. It helps you grow. Grow in trust, grow in faith, grow in everything. Beyond question, the absolute power of God is sovereign over all his creation. Psalm 135, 6 sums it up this way. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in earth and, and in the seas and in all the deep places. That's what he does. That's his absolute power. You can't grasp it. You can't grasp eternity, but you can grasp this, that if you know him as Savior, that power rests on you. That's what Paul said. When he prayed three times to get the thorn out of his side, what did he say? He said, Jesus said, I'm not taking it out. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And what, it, what was Paul's response to that thing that was tormenting him? He said, then I glory in my tribulations that the power of God rests on me. And the power of God rests on all of his people. All that we have to do is turn the ignition with faith, put it in gear with, with application, and that power empowers us to live our life in ways the lost world can't even imagine. A few thoughts I want you to take home. You belong to an eternal God who has absolute power to care for you now and for eternity. Psalm 1611 says, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's eternity. He has a plan for your life, Jeremiah 29, 11. And his absolute power orders our steps. Psalm 37, 23, 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, what I was saying, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. He loves you. He loves you with all of his heart. He loves you with all of his son's blood. He loved you that much. He's not going to let anything happen to you. If you're listening to this and you don't have that kind of love, you don't have God's love in you, you don't have that, that uh, unconditional love, you see me or call me, and I'll show you in his word how he wants you to partake of that blood so you don't have to leave this world in sin. So when you go home today, rejoice. You can go home singing hymns, rejoice any way you like, because your life here and your life in eternity, both, are regulated and protected 
by the absolute power of your sovereign father. Let's pray. There's so much involved with this. <laughs> I can't even touch the surface, Lord. But thank you for what you've given us. And we do pray, God, you let us leave here um, rejoicing and knowing that that you have absolute power and that power rests on us to do absolutely everything in this life. We can get through this life with that power. And Lord, we do live in troubled times, but with you, it's nothing. Thank you, Father, for your love and your goodness. And as we sing our last hymn, we do. Pr I pray, Lord, that you would stir hearts if you know Christ as your Savior, to make a, a greater commitment to him. And if you don't, to come to know him. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen.